All right, so again, thank you all for being guinea pigs. I apologize in advance if y'all fall asleep, but um, I was asked, as I kind of said, I was asked to lead the annual sermon by Reverend Al Fletcher like six or seven months ago, um, and I became very concerned. All of you guys know this already, but I tend to be kind of a strange duck. I tend to look at the world about 15 degrees off center. And so when he said, I would like you, Pastor Brad, to come out and lead our annual sermon in front of about 100 ministers and probably another couple hundred laity from all of our American Baptists of Maine churches, I said, why? <laughs> like, are you sure? How many thousands of people have turned down this before you're asking me? And he chuckled. He says, well, we're going to do it on discipleship. And I followed up with, again, why? <laughs> He knows that I'm a contemporary of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. We did the entire Life Together study that I did for a class that he taught. He knows my views when it comes to discipleship and proper lightness. And his comment was, that's what I really want them to hear. And I said, all right. So I panicked because very recently we set it up where a bunch of the ministers that are going to be there are actually going to be here on November 12th, like detailing and going line by line through my ordination paper, and I'm like, wow, if ever I need a sermon to land, it's going to have to be this one. Um, but uh, I'm happy to do it. It's an honor to be invited, and I'll explain that to them at the very beginning. Um, and it's unique when you ever do this, because they have the entire American Baptist Church's executive board actually like picks the scripture that you're working with. And so he said, all right, you're going to be talking about discipleship, and it's going to be on 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 2 through 3a. And I'll read it for you right now. And then you, you, you all know this, but they don't, that I tend to like bring you along in my sermon writing journey. I look at it as a journey that we both take, and you guys just seem to like to show up at the destination sometimes. But I remind you of how great the pictures were before. Um, so 2 Timothy 2 through 2. 2 Timothy 2, 2 through 3 eight. There's way too many twos in that. But anyway, there's like one too many twos. Anyway, and it says, And the things you have heard me say in the presence of the many witnesses, and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Join with me, dot, dot, dot. And so when I first wrestled the scripture, I sat down, I'm like, you know what, I'm ready for this. Let's day in, let me pull out some crazy truths that a bunch of pastors with doctorates would be like, mind blown. And I'm like, that's a tall task, but let's do this. And I started asking myself questions, because that's what I do when I begin a sermon, is I write down like questions that I want to answer. And some of my questions were, what are the things that they have heard? Because that's in the scripture. Who are these witnesses that Paul's talking about? Who's considered a reliable person? What does it take to teach or be qualified to teach? I'm like, let's look at this. And every time I started digging through these passages, I got nervous because my eyes kept going to the dot, dot, dot. Join with me, dot, dot, dot. And I kept going back and saying, why did they give me 3A? Now, you know me. I desire to preach, as Acts 20 says, the entire counsel of God. So I generally don't like cutting off verses. I read the Bible by passages. I read it by chapters. And in some cases, I read it by books. So that I understand the proper context. And so I get cynical. And I get a little skeptical when people give me an A at the end of a verse citation. Because I'm like, what is B? And why don't they want me to know it? And so I immediately opened up my wonderful NIV. Because this is in the NIV. And I opened it up and I said, alright, what is B? And understanding what B is made me start asking different questions for my sermon to prep it. It started making me ask, why did Paul write 2 Timothy? What was Paul going through when he wrote 2 Timothy? And what does discipleship <coughs> entail based on Paul's writings here? And the reason I started asking those questions is because when I finish verse B of the passage, verse B is, join with me. In suffering, like a good soldier to Christ. And my first response was, why doesn't the executive board of APCOM want me 
to talk about join with me in suffering. And then I followed it up with, you know what? Why do American Christians always seem to avoid the topic of suffering? Because we do. When we talk about suffering, we talk about trials, when we talk about struggle, we try to hide from it, we try to avoid it. We try to feel like struggling and suffering is part of failure in our walk with God. When in reality, it can be some of the best signs that we have that we're walking properly with God. But why do we as an American church avoid it? And let me be clear, we do. There's a reason why the largest church in our country, I won't use the pastor's name, but he wrote a best-selling book called Your Best Life Now, which is, the, the title itself is unbiblical. I hope this isn't our best life now. I hope this isn't as good as it gets. We have scripture. We, knows that, we know that it gets better. But he is filled with people in a sanctuary and on television because that's the message people want to hear. We want life to be great. We want amazement. We want joy when we study scripture. And when we become Christians, we want everything to get super easy and simple. There's a reason why the Kenneth Copelands of the world on TV have millions of viewers every week while he preaches to them that if you're going through hardship, you just ain't praying hard enough. Or you're not giving enough to the church. Your chemotherapy's not working? Well, that's just because you haven't taken out a second mortgage and sent it into our ministries yet because Papa Copeland, he can't fly coach. He needs a private jet. But people are desperate for that because they, they feel like their pain and their struggle and their journey with God is a failure when we suffer, when we struggle. But that's not the case. If they had just given me verse 2, you would have gotten a very different sermon today. But they gave me an A. And so I'll preach the A. Because it makes us look at 2 Timothy with new eyes and new perspective. I'll tell you, I just dealt with this. I agree with her. I just dealt with this. All of you should really be like that. I mean, come on. Let's, let's get a little more Baptist in here for a little while, right? Let's applaud. I'm just kidding. Um, going through, I'm going through the books of the Bible and one of my classes at Temple Academy, and we came to the book of Job, and we spent an entire day talking about Job. And I asked the class, what is the book of Job about? And they're like, well, it's a story about this guy who was good because God said he was good, and then Satan talk, told God he's only good because you gave him everything, and God said, well, take it all away, and I'll prove that he still praises me. And then they said, all right, and then what happens? He goes, well, Job loses everything. He loses his family, his livestock, his buildings. He loses his health in some cases. He gets covered in boils. But then he kneels down and he still praises God. He says, to, uh, naked I came into the world, naked I will depart, I will still praise you. And I said, congratulations, you summed up Job. Chapter one, there's 41 other chapters of Job. What are those about? And they're like, I don't know. That's all my Sunday school teacher taught me was chapter one, I guess. I didn't, I didn't get anything else. And that's because we are, avoid the idea of suffering. We avoid the idea of struggling and turmoil. But that's not the gospel. That's not the truth. That's not how we should have a proper form view of what it means to be a Christian in discipleship, in obedience to God, walking with him in this world. And so when we look at 2 Timothy, not by verse 2 through 3a, but through the entirety of 2 Timothy, because I like reading the Bible in its entirety for its context, we start seeing the heart of Paul writing this letter. And it's heartbreaking when you read it all the way through, and I challenge all of you to do it, either tonight or this week. It doesn't take you long, maybe a half hour. But it's heartbreaking when you hear him writing, because you start hearing a man who is struggling and suffering in pretty deep, profound ways. And I'll discuss three of them very quickly here. And I'll use alliteration because I'm a pastor and I think we're required to do it. I'm not sure if it's in a contract. But he's struggling physically, he's struggling politically, and he's struggling pastorally. He's struggling physically because in chapter 1, verse 16, he says that he is in chains. Paul is arrested. 
And while some people will throw in the word he's in house arrest, it's Rome. Trust me, house arrest is still arrested. And in verse 4, 6 through 7, Paul's talking about how he expects to die soon. He says, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time for my departure has come. He's anticipating his death. He's struggling politically. He makes it clear that while he's arrested and going through a legal defense, it's not going well because in um, chapter 4, verse 16, he says, At first, my defense, at my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. So Paul's not getting the help and support that he needs. So he's struggling politically in Rome. And finally, he's struggling pastorally because he discusses in 2 Timothy about all of the people who have turned away from his teachings and turned away from him because they're embarrassed that he got arrested. In chapter 1, verse 11, says, uh, sorry, no, uh, verse 115, he says, You are all aware that all who are in Asia have turned away from me. They're walking away from him because he must not be right. He's in jail. He says a little bit later in chapter 4, verse 14, he says, Alexander the, cop the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. We don't know what that harm is. He's expecting Timothy to already know. But it's either physical or something against his ministry. So he's struggling in a deep level in those three key aspects of life. But the key backing behind 2 Timothy that Paul reminds us of multiple times is that suffering and struggling isn't part of failure. It's an essential element of our walk with God and our service to Christ. Because he says in verse uh, chapter 1, verse 11 through 12, For which I was appointed as preacher and apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as you do. Meaning, the fact that he's teaching and preaching and being an apostle anticipates suffering to come. And then he moves that to us in chapter 3, verse 12, where he says, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. Woo, doggy. <coughs> and I have to tell you that if I was saved by a minister who preached the prosperity gospel, I wouldn't be a minister today. I probably wouldn't be a Christian today. Because within the first year of me being saved, when I lived in Reno, Nevada, I went through the hardest time of my life. Months after I put my faith in Christ, the store that I worked at, I was a manager for, got a new store manager, and he was a horrible boss. He held us to an impossible standard. He was hypocritical with his standard. He didn't teach and grow us. He outright harassed and belittled us on a regular occasion. And though I survived for a year, which was better than a lot of the other managers, I couldn't overcome him. And within a year of me being a Christian, I had lost my job. I had lost my house. I had to move back to Maine with Kira was four, Zachary was almost one, and Amber was like six or seven months pregnant with Gabe. We moved into one bedroom in our sister-in-law's house, which was such a blessing that we had a roof over our house. And we lived there for three or four months until I was able to find a part-time job and then a full-time job making minimum wage just so I can find a small, not ideal apartment just so that we could have our space of our own again. The Lord blessed me countlessly through that, but I could have been tempted to say, oh man, I must have done it wrong. Because how do you go from accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior to your entire life falls apart? And if I, had, if I didn't have the voice of Pastor Michael Smith who brought me to Christ saying, suffering is part of the walk, buddy. If I didn't have the voice of Pastor Gary York who said, you know what, suffering, it happens. I'm there with you through every step of the way. If I didn't find the author Dietrich Bonhoeffer and read the cost of discipleship and be encouraged by his writings, I could have said, forget this, I'm done. But you know what I didn't? I was encouraged because I didn't see my suffering as a mistake or failure. I saw it as a part of my walk. And I'm here in front of you right now because of that pain, that struggle, that turmoil. Not, a, not opposed to it. And so that's why some of the most important voices in my life have guided me and encouraged me. But I want to take a second to talk to you about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. 
And yes, I know all of you know about him because you're my congregation, but they might not, all right? So just <laughs> buckle in. Because every time I talk about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, like 30% of the hands go up. But I thoroughly believe that like, if they made a movie from Hollywood about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and I think they made like a B movie, but if they made like an A-list movie, people wouldn't believe it because it's too fancy. It's too fantastic. It's too over the top, his journey in life. He was born in 1906. He became a minister. His parents, he was from a very wealthy family. His dad was like the leading psychiatrist in all of Germany. And he grew up in a Germany that was desperate. Germany had, when he finally went to school, had lost World War I, or I should say committed an armistice against World, uh, at the end of World War I. And Germany was put in a very, very horrible position. The Allies extracted a heavy price for the end of World War I, a price that ultimately collapsed the German economy, humiliated the German people at a deep level, desiring them for revenge. And by the end of the 1920s, it became very clear that Germany was no longer going to be a democracy under, under a czar, but was ultimately going to move into either a fascist dictatorship or a communist country. Fascist won with Nazi Germany. This was the world Bonhoeffer preached in. Bonhoeffer was brilliant. He could have been a concert pianist. Um, he chose ministry. So while Germany was becoming ethnically cleansed, for lack of a better term, Bonhoeffer was in Italy, in Rome, on Easter, seeing how multicultural and multiracial the kingdom of God was. While Germany was suffering desperately, he was serving the poor as best as he could in the churches in Germany, from which he learned in Harlem. And when the Lutheran church became thoroughly Nazified, hanging Nazi banners more than the crucifix throughout their churches. Bonhoeffer had already lived in America and taught in universities here, and he developed an understanding of what it means to suffer because his fame, his found church when he was in America was a black church in Harlem. Oh, man, you can't get much more gospel than a black church in Harlem. Trust me, I've been there. That was the world that Bonhoeffer was raised. So when he comes back to Germany during World War II under Nazi occupation, what does Bonhoeffer do? He pushes back. The Lutheran Church becomes the state church of Nazi Germany. So he, with a couple other peers, start the Confessing Church as a response to keep the gospel light alive in Germany through maybe the darkest time in all of history. When the seminaries are shut down, he starts an illegal one, structuring it on the Sermon on the Mount. And when that gets struck, shut down, and everyone gets drafted into the military, he goes into military intelligence to do his best part. Dietrich Bonhoeffer works in military intelligence and is eventually arrested because while the Nazis are shoving Jews into furnaces, he is actively working to have them escape and seek refuge outside of Germany, and he is arrested for doing it, for saving Jews. And while he is serving in prison ministry in Germany, it becomes clear that although allegedly, it was very likely he had some role in an assassination attempt against Hitler, being a courier of messages between parties. It's not confirmed, but when he writes his book, Ethics, you can hear the man struggle with the idea of how do you seek the greater good in evil? A question that he doesn't appropriately answer or doesn't answer outright in his book, he only wrestles with. Bonhoeffer lives through the entire war up until two weeks before Hitler commits suicide. But he never sees a Germany free from Nazi tyranny. His death warrant is personally signed by Adolf Hitler for his complicity in those two plots. And two weeks before Hitler kills himself, he is dragged to the gallows, naked, in a concentration camp, and hanged. He died as a martyr defending the gospel in Germany. His last moments on earth is reported by, the not, by one of the Nazi head medical examiners who witnessed him kneeling, praying thanks to God, that God would use him in such a powerful way and that he could give his life to better the gospel in this world. That Nazi doctor, by the way, credited Bonhoeffer's moment as bringing him to Christ later in life. Because how amazing is it to watch someone who is Christian suffer and praise God?
It changes the world. It also gives strength to his teachings in my eyes. Because I'm a simple guy, and I have a simple policy that if you're going to say something, back it up. So when Bonhoeffer teaches, salvation is free, but discipleship will cost you your life, and then he dies being a disciple to Christ, I'm like, whew, all right. I see you. Which also gives weight to some of his other sayings. I'll give you just a few of them right now. Tell me if any of these will preach. Nothing that we despise in other men is inherently absent from ourselves. We must learn to regard people less in the light of what they do or don't do and more in the light of what they suffer. Imagine if we looked at everyone not based on how we expect them to behave, but how they behave based on what they've gone through. Ooh, that's a powerful spot. Bonhoeffer says, the ultimate test of a moral society is the kind of world that it leaves for its children. Ooh, carry that to the ballot box on November. And finally, one act of obedience is worth a hundred sermons. Oh man, will that preach. Bonhoeffer delivers powerful messages that we see him struggle with. We see him go through. He says, it is not simply to bandage the victims under the wheels of injustice. We have a moral obligation to drive a, a stake through the spokes and break the wheel. That's what he did in Nazi Germany. His teachings are profound. His life is an example of true martyrdom and servants to Christ. If you read his letters and papers from prison, you see a rise and fall with him like very few others have. He wrestled with the gospel in powerful and humility, humble ways that we all should be. But many of his books are worth 10,000 sermons because he backed up what he said. He wasn't afraid to struggle. He wasn't afraid to suffer. He saw it as part of obedience. And he saw it as part of discipleship to serve God. But, you know what, since I was told that it's bad taste to end a sermon on a downer, let me give you more backing of 2 Timothy. Because 2 Timothy is about Paul suffering and how that is part of our experience. But Paul is also teaching Timothy that suffering is far from the most important part of our journey with God. That it is nothing compared to the work of Jesus Christ. Christ going to the cross Christ dying for our sins so that we may be saved from damnation, saved from eternal separation from God, and that we may have salvation on his work and not our own behalf. For that, suffering is far worth it. Our struggles, our trials, and suffering is nothing compared to the amazing opportunity of being saved and being able to serve Christ. Second Timothy 1, 8 through 10. He says, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me as his prisoner, but share in the suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of our own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before ages began. Woo, doggy. Smile when things get hard, because you get to serve a God. And guess what? What Christ does makes everything else great. Makes everything else secondary. Paul's letter isn't just about simple suffering. That's just simply the backdrop of what he's experiencing. The letter reads, and why I say it's powerful to read it, it reads as if it's the final charge from a mentor to an apprentice. Paul is seeing his ministry come to a close, and he's encouraging Timothy's ministry to grow and continue forward. And Paul's ministry never truly comes to a close. The Holy Spirit has guided his words so profoundly that 13 books of the Bible are penned by him. But he is looking for the church of the future. He's looking to make sure that Timothy stays on the right track, and he encourages him. And now, there is a lot of Holy Spirit-inspired and structured instruction in 2 Timothy, but I'm afraid of the 
Academy Award style music rising as I get closer to where I am for time. So let me just give you one section to highlight and tell you what Timothy, what Paul says to Timothy. He says, remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does not, which does no do, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Do your best to prevent yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed in rightly handling the truth. Here, he quickly tells Timothy, don't fight about unessential things. Stone, it's not worth our time. Do you believe that the millennium is a thousand years of symbolic? I don't care. Focus on the gospel. Show unity in the faith of the world. Serve others. He says, live what you preach. Behave the way you speak. Make yourself one approved. And make sure you rightly apply the word of God when you live it and teach it. Y'all, that seems like pretty solid advice to me. Advice that I pray you all follow. And so what do I want you to take away from this? Well, for one, ensure that you use God's word rightly. There's a lot of A's in Christian books out there that break off the verse. Read a Christian book with your Bible. Make sure that the passage is in context and that you know what the entire word of God says, not just what the author in that book wants you to know. Make sure that it, you apply God's word rightly in your life. It is better to get a hard truth from the word of God that makes you have to think differently or change your behavior than it is to cherry pick verses out of context so that the word of God can support how you feel. It's far better to do the first. But be encouraged if you are struggling personally or within your church. You see, many of our churches are struggling with attendance or struggling with getting the younger generation here. Struggling isn't necessarily a problem. Sometimes it forces us to change our perspective. Sometimes it forces us to open our vision to what God is planning for us. And I'll give you an example of how that worked in my life. When I came to Smithfield in ministry, I had that great burden that all new pastors have, grow the church. Thankfully, I had some wise teachers in my corner that says, it's not my job to grow the church, it's my job to preach the word, it's your job to grow the church. How well are you guys doing? That's the goal. But I had that burden. Entice young families, start a youth group, start a Bible study for children, make sure that we have all this stuff. Let's get young families, let's bring life and vibrancy into it. And so I struggled for years before COVID really spun everything around with what does that look like? I spent time with youth leaders and other groups. We marketed directly to its family in some places. And I, if I'm being honest, I put an unnecessary burden on the brothers and sisters in this church to help make an impact on that. But it wasn't until 2019, I don't remember the exact date, but I know it was before COVID, so I'm saying 2019, because it's kind of a BC and 80 moment for most ministers these days that I was reading Matthew chapter 19, verse 14, and it hit me like a lightning bolt. Where it says, But Jesus said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for such belongs to the kingdom of heaven. And I asked myself, Do I want children in this church because I want their young families to be here putting money in the offering plate and raising our attendance? Or do I want children in this church because I want to try to have an impact on the younger generation. Which one is it? And I bet a lot of our churches around us are probably having to wrestle with that question if they haven't had it already. And the answer for me was, I think I've been working on the first one, but I really need to be working on the second one. And so I asked the Lord, let me make an impact in the youth however you desire that to happen, God. And you know what? That has brought more children into this church because Emma has had one. <laughs> and Alex and Rose has adopted one. That's not the growth that I was probably thinking. If any of you guys want to have kids, though, it's very effective, I promise you. It's like doubled our kid attendance in this church. But where did I start seeing God move when I asked myself earnestly that question, I want to minister to the younger generation? Immediately, I got a phone call, and it's like immediately 
from Pastor David Brown after he had got sick that said, I can't lead Intro to Camp at China Lake Camp. Can you step in for me? And so I did. And since then, since 2019, I've led multiple camps as a coordinator, as a pastor, as a counselor, as a servant at China Lake Camp. God moved me into that space so that I can minister to kids. And since then, God has moved me to a deeper role through basketball coaching at Temple Academy. And now being chaplain in the primary high school Bible, the only primary, the only high school, or the only high school Bible teacher at Temple Academy. And so every day, Monday through Friday, not including bank holidays, I get to sit with 96 high schoolers and talk about the Word of God. God moved me to spaces. Did that put a butt in this congregation? No. Is this church impacting the younger generations because of these ministries? Absolutely. I'm out there. You guys are out there. Many of you volunteered at China Lake Camp. This is where it gets kind of weird because I'm talking to a bunch of churches that aren't you. And so I challenge all of you churches out here. How many of you are looking for youth in your congregation? You're not even thinking that China Lake Camp is here. Because China Lake Camp is an essential ministry of the American Baptist Churches of Maine. And like good Christians, they are struggling for financial support. They are struggling for volunteers. How many of us want to grow the younger generation, but they only want to do it if it affects their bottom line in their churches? I challenge every one of you churches out there to walk out of here today asking, how can I give to China Lake Camp? How can I serve at China Lake Camp? How can I make reaching children a priority in my ministry and in my life? Not just something that I say so that the coffers will get a little more full with their working parents involved. It is amazing how God can move you if you open your views and you choose to be a disciple of Christ and not control how God is moving you. And so my final piece of encouragement for you Not every church program is going to work. It's just not. It's not a unique problem to us today. Because guess what? Paul was trying to go to Spain. He made it to Rome. It's okay when something doesn't work. It's not a mistake. It's not a failure. As long as your church is preaching the gospel well, as long as you are serving the poor, and as long as you are equipping the saints in that church for obedience and discipleship towards Christ, your church is on the right track. Wherever your attendance is. I'll end, you, I'll end this if you ever get discouraged with a quote that one of the most important voices in my life in ministry, Pastor Gary York, told me before I began at A. He says, in ministry... It is better to be faithful than successful. I have kept that through 2020. I've kept that through 2019. And I keep that today. I pray it encourages you. May God bless all of you. Let us pray. Lord, I ask you to be with this church. I ask you to be with our brothers and sisters, not only here, but in churches around. That your word be preached well and rightly. That their churches... Feel your presence and that they recognize that if they are struggling, that it is not necessarily a mistake. Be with them, encourage them, and give us opportunities to serve alongside them. Look after us, bring wisdom and guidance to us. We ask this in your name. Amen. All right, I'll put that back together in a second. Oh, where's my bulletin? Did I bury my bulletin? Is this it? Nope, that's definitely not it. Uh oh. Anyone, anyone, tell me what the hymn is today? Four o five. Perfect. Please open your Bibles to four o five. <laughs>